I was convinced early on that we were dealing with a serial killer. And if we really know the truth, I believe he's probably killed more people in Oregon than probably anybody else. For a predator to be in, in, in a pen with all of the, 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 the victims, who knows how many victims he's got? He had opportunity. When that opportunity presented itself, he took advantage of it. I don't know why. I mean, why, why? I guess he didn't need a reason. What are the odds of being a prime suspect in all these murders? Uh, it wasn't until later his first victim that, that I even found out about, about this woman and that she was still alive and saying, oh man, she is lucky to be alive. He's always been a, a demon in my life, lurking in the back of my head. And I found these words that express it very perfectly. It's called my darkness within. Some of my demons left me. Some are just asleep. A few always travel with me. Others haunt me from the deep. He was one of those. The little ones are charming. They are allowed to stay. The big ones tear me up inside. I just wish they'd go away. I'm sorry. I know this road, like the back of my hair. Same with the stations, only up and back. Farms and truck stops, fireworks stand. I know this road like the back of my hand. Beginning in the late 1970s, a sinister presence cast a shadow over an isolated part of central Oregon. It lurked in the background, ignored or unnoticed. Women, often vulnerable or marginalized, were disappearing. It wasn't until decades later that a reckoning finally came. My name is Noelle Crombie, and I'm a staff writer for The Oregonian. Over the past two years, I've investigated these crimes and the man who is suspected of committing them. I've read thousands of pages of police reports, traveled halfway across the country, interviewed dozens of witnesses, and spent countless hours driving the road along which the killings took place. This is a complicated story that jumps around in time. So throughout this video series, you'll hear from people who were present at the events they describe, as well as those who investigated them, in some instances, much later. You'll hear tapes of police interviews that were conducted years after some of the events they address, You'll learn information that has never before been made public. These are the stories of the ghosts of Highway 20. Well, let me ask you another question then in this area. At any time ever, now think of this carefully, okay. Have you uh, gone ahead and been charged with any sex crime? Ever a suspect in any sexual crime? Uh, yes. In 1977, Marlene Gabrielson was 20 years old. She lived in the small city of Lebanon along Highway 20 with her husband and their new baby. One night that June, the young couple dropped their daughter off with a friend so they could spend the night at the sisters' rodeo. I was underage, shouldn't have been drinking, and I got angry about something, now I can't remember, so stupid that I just walked off and said, fine, I'm going to go home. She asked around for a ride, and eventually a man with a pickup offered to take her home to Lebanon, about 80 miles away. I thought there was nothing wrong. I'd be safe. It wasn't that far from home. 
I didn't even look around inside the vehicle. All I knew it was just a beat up old truck and I was going home to my kid. The man with the old truck was John Arthur Ackroyd. Ackroyd was in his late 20s and lived in Sweet Home. He'd recently returned to the area after getting out of the army and was working for a local welding company, though within a year he'd be employed by the state as a highway mechanic. That night, he took Marlene West toward Lebanon on Highway 20, a road he knew well. I noticed that there was no, like, covers on the doors. There was no handles and no roll-you-down thing. I sat in the passenger seat and didn't even think, didn't even phase me that this was a trap. Highway 20 twists and turns as it winds from Sisters to Lebanon, carving its way through mountainsides covered in dense evergreen forest. It's a sleepy stretch of road with little development and few landmarks, and it's dark at night. Exits lead to logging roads or campgrounds and quickly disappear into the brush. I fell asleep well, passed out. I woke up with my head banging on the seat and the edge of the outside of the truck door. He had grabbed me by my ankles and just yarded me out of there like I was just a rag dolly. And then he picked me up by the back of my neck and my hair and threw me up against this like a little hill. I felt like I was in a hollow because it was I remember it was beautiful because it was all green and little flowers blooming, little tiny ones. First thing I thought was, how can you be hurt in this kind of beauty? All I remember about it is this girl needed a ride home. She was over at Sister's Rodeo, and she was worried about her baby. She pleaded with me to go ahead and, and take her home so she can check on her baby. I said, OK. She wanted to pull over, and you know she kept sexually advancing towards me. So you know, I pulled over. We tried to do it. I couldn't get up, and she got all bent out of shape. He grabbed this knife out of a coffee can. That's where he kept his buck knife, the big knife he held to my throat. He put the knife to my throat and told me I was going to do everything he said. And I said, yes, I will. And he stuck the knife in the ground next to me. He grabbed the front of my pants, belt and all, and ripped my pants straight down, all the way down the front of my legs, and then he gets his knife and starts cutting off my boots. I just kept thinking, just close your eyes, but I kept, um, and just let it happen. Uh, she accused you of having a knife, right? When you break it, I thought it was, did you have a knife? There was a knife in the hand, not like uh, one big one. What road it looked like? The way you see my dad is a drop back. So, that's what? That black, black handle with the rock and the other color. Did you, did you threaten her with an eye? No. Did you cut her clothes off? <coughs> no. Cut her clothes? No. Did she? She took her clothes off. Did you carry any of them? In the mud, not there while I was there. He would grab my face like this, and because I would turn my head, and he would make it open your eyes, you look at me. Yeah, so I had to look at him, and I did. He got done doing you when he wanted and he kind of stood over me and looked at me all you know standing over me with a hand on his hip 
wiping his sweat away. You get treated like that and you don't even feel human. I just laid there and kind of wanted just to seep into the earth, just take my body and renew, bring new life in, something that's much happier than I am at this moment. He was gonna go in toward his truck and getting in keys in his pockets and I said, okay, she's gonna leave me here, buck ass naked. I, I didn't want him to stay, but I didn't want to be naked out in the woods. I think he started gathering up my clothes, what was left there, because he didn't want to leave anything. My boots and, and all that um, stuff he ripped off of me. I just had my jacket on and a little t-shirt top. He goes, now do I, what do I do with you? I go, you take me home. He goes, I don't know. Let me tell you, I was talking real fast, real low and real sweet because evidently I wanted to live. I had a brand new baby and a new husband. Ackroyd agreed to take Marlene home that night. Her jeans had been torn during the rape, so he gave her a pair of dirty pants. On the drive, she did all she could to keep him at ease, knowing a rifle and hunting knife were within easy reach. I didn't want to make him angry. And he asked me if I'd be his girlfriend. And I looked down and I see that coffee can with the knife in it. I said, yes. I had him take, him to, take me to my husband's mother's house, got on the porch and just started pounding on the door. He left immediately, just, just left. She goes, oh my God, what happened to you? I had bushes, twigs in my hair. She goes, you need to get in the bathtub right now. And I said, no, I can't get in the bathtub right now. I've just been raped. She wanted me to wash him off. No. I wasn't gonna wash them off. I'd hold that shit in until they got it. He will be in trouble once the police come and help me. I did go to the hospital and had a rape kit done. Then I took my shower. Marlene's rape kit showed vaginal swelling and bruising and abrasions on her back and legs. She went to police and showed them her pants, which had been torn from the crotch to her ankles, her underwear, which had been cut with a knife, and her slashed boots. Despite this physical evidence, police were skeptical. They interviewed Marlene several times, focusing on minor inconsistencies in her story. They had her take a polygraph and concluded she was not telling the truth. Ultimately, they declined to pursue the case. You took a photograph on that, didn't you? Oh, did you? Thank you, man. I don't know. I did. I think you passed? Yeah. I can't, I don't remember if I did. <laughs> kind of out of your history. You passed yeah. <laughs> I always thought that that's why these people get paid to protect you. They care. That's what I thought. They care about you. All this system was put in place to protect people, not judge them by who you're married to, what color your skin is. They made me feel like a smelly, drunken native, so I just shrank. It's just another something that I went in my little life, in my young days. I let my guard down and I was so angry. 
so angry. If they would only had listened to me. And you know, I feel guilty sometimes. If they would have just listened to me. It, it could have all been avoided. All of it. Marlene was a vulnerable young woman whose assault by a stranger should have provoked outrage and a demand for justice. Instead, her account was disbelieved, deepening her sense of trauma. The implications of law enforcement's failure to believe Marlene and aggressively pursue Ackroyd would be felt along Highway 20 for decades. She was his first known victim. Maybe, if police had listened to her, she would have been his last. The deputy stopped in and uh, told me that she had brought, went down and brought charges of rape against me, which was a shock, you know. Mm-hmm. And they said they're investigating it. And I talked with the deputy a couple times, and uh, he said, don't worry about it. He said, this probably will not come to court. All charges was dropped. They were supposed to put this man somewhere where he could not hurt anyone else. Look what happens. Look what happens. I hear I'm the only freaking survivor. A lot of people would like to know uh, really what happened. And I think deep inside, somebody probably also is feeling like they'd like to have someone gain the consequences of what they should get over this whole situation. I think she probably, they stopped. You know, she probably ran. He got his gun out. Came across her jogging all alone on a road with no traffic and uh, abducted her and killed her and dumped her in the woods. John just told me, he said, well, you know I'm the last person I saw her alive. I know this road like the back of my head Same with the stations Only half them back Farms and truck stops Fireworks dance. Yeah, I know this road like the back of my hand. By December of 1978, it had been about a year and a half since John Ackroyd had raped Marlene Gabrielson. He'd suffered no consequences other than a beating by Marlene's husband shortly after the attack. But that winter, he would become intertwined with a different crime. It would follow him for the rest of his life and haunt a quiet community for decades. There was another case where I had seen this girl and then all of a sudden she turns up missing. Mm-hmm. It was a Kate Turner. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would suspect, you know, under an investigation of that. In 1978, Kay Turner was 35 years old. She lived with her husband, Noel, in Eugene and worked as a manager at a local public health agency. Kay and Noel lived across the street. I didn't get to know them right away, but pretty soon um, they became like good neighbors. Somewhere in the mid-70s, she started running. A lot of us started running. I mean, we we just, uh, you know, I mean, it was right around the time of Prefontaine. Kay took it up somewhere in 76, 77. She didn't just take it up. It became a way of life. Kay ran a marathon in September of 1978 and hadn't let up a few months later when even a cold winter morning wasn't enough to keep her inside. 
on vacation with her husband and a group of friends at Camp Sherman, a retreat outside of Sisters, she woke up early and headed out on a run. She was going to run in the morning and, as a matter of fact, had wanted uh, my wife to run with her, but my wife had just taken up running and I think was a little embarrassed or you just couldn't run with Kay the distance Kay would want to run and as fast. Uh, it was still a little undecided, but in the morning, my wife at the last minute decided not to go with her. Kay's exact route isn't known, but she expected it to take about an hour. When she hadn't returned after more than twice that long, her husband and friends began to worry. I guess I knew Kay too well, um, and she was too stable and too smart. Um, to either get lost or to run away or whatever people were thinking. They searched, but found no sign of her. Soon, they called the police. I received a call from the Salem Patrol Office regarding a missing jogger at Camp Sherman. The district attorney in Madras requested that the state police help assist the sheriff office and investigate the crime. Lieutenant Veneto, Bob Cooley, and myself was over at Camp Sherman interviewing people regarding this missing Kay Turner. A couple of high school boys said, well, you ought to look, talk to John Ackroyd. He's seen her since we did. That's when Ackroyd's first name came up. Tom Hanna, who worked with him at uh, Sanium, he was he lived in Camp Sherman, and he got off work about the same time John did, I think. And when he drove down and went that back road to get to the store, he saw Ackroyd's pickup in close proximity to where Kate Turner was running. Ackroyd was interviewed in, in January, January 11th, I think, and he had said, yeah, I was there. He said he did see her jogging along the road. He wasn't really a, a suspect, or only just of interest. You were in that area that morning. Right. Yes. Can you tell us about that? How you happened to be there and where you had been earlier? Well, like I told you, it's uh, this one friend of mine would uh, be wanting to go and get some medicine. And he didn't have a gun. I had a 22. And you were going to go get him here. Because they, they needed the meat and didn't have no money. And, he was on the kitchen. And he had arranged this the night before or sometime before? Uh, it was a couple days before, I guess. The friend whose family needed food was Roger Dale Beck. Ackroyd's account of that morning shifted over time, but he said that on the day before Christmas, he got off work from an overnight shift at Santiam Junction at around 6.45 a.m. He said he then drove west on Highway 20 to help a disabled motorist, turned around and made his way to Camp Sherman to see if there were any deer in the area. There, he saw Kay Turner running for the first time. He then realized he was low on fuel and decided to head to a gas station about 10 miles away. He turned around and passed Kay for the second time. In some versions of his story, he claims he stopped and spoke to her briefly after almost hitting a dog with his truck. Okay, so she was running. When you went in, she was running south. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And when you came, and when you seen her the second time, she was running the same direction? Yeah. Okay. And then the dog ran out, and you had to stop? Yeah. 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 And you talked to her? I asked her if I'd heard it. I didn't feel the talk or anything. I said, well, I told her, I said, well, Merry Christmas. She said, Merry Christmas to me, and I drove off. Ackroyd says he then continued on to Sisters, filling up his tank before meeting up with Beck and heading out to poach a deer with his 22 caliber rifle. John was an outdoorsman. He knew, you know, he would talk to me about tracking things. He was a hunter. And hunters does not necessarily restrict it to animals. Did you see the shoots out? What was it? Remember? Buck, no? No, I believe. No. And you 
Lance are going to try. So a nice big gun. One to Rogers. Who shot it? I did. One shot, two shots. One shot. Where'd you get it at? Right between the eyes. Mostly friends of Kay Turner's, and uh, most of them will be from Grant's past. Uh, she grew up down there, of course, and uh, that uh, their friends coming up now to help us out here. How long do you continue a search like this until it just it was given up? Well, in many cases, we we probably would have given up some time ago, but. Uh, in this case, I guess there's enough people who are still interested in wondering what happened uh, that they want to continue. Kay had visited her parents two weeks before her trip to Camp Sherman. In their garage, on a pad of paper she knew her dad would later find, she wrote, Hi, Dad. I love you. Kay. He didn't come across that note until after she had disappeared. It was the last time her family or friends would ever hear from her. The only signs of her that remained were some running shoe tracks in the mud by the side of a Camp Sherman road. The tracker had, this is when Nike was just brand new and they were all waffle footprints. He had her, the tr a, a boot, big boot tracks with a heavy guy and this, and these Nike footprints going up this trail that would, from the paved road up to ultimately where her remains were found in that direction. This guy comes in and says, you know, I found these tracks and I'm pretty sure they're hers and involved in this. Tracks of, of her footprint or was she dragged or what was Well, it was, it was her footprints plus a man's boot. And from the tracks, it appeared that there had been a struggle and that they had gone off to the side of the road and then back. So this is where uh, she would have gotten, had been taken. Right, right out through. Within a week, you know, a few days after she disappeared, they go through her desk and they find that in the last six weeks he spent two extended weekends away with two, each, you know, two other boyfriends, you know, each of whom is married. So, you know, the cops, you know, they got, a, they got five suspects, five potential suspects. They got a husband, they got two boyfriends, and they got two boyfriends' wives. You know, it's hard to find a needle in a haystack, but if you got five people that you got names of, you go talk to them. You know, they searched for, couldn't find her. The original investigators were convinced the husband did it. So they really missed a lot of things. Noel Turner, who eventually left Camp Sherman with a car full of unopened Christmas presents for his wife, hadn't known about Kay's affairs. By concentrating on him in those early days of the investigation, police lost valuable time and gave short shrift to other aspects of the case. Normally, when somebody dumps a body in the woods, they don't go miles out in there. It, you really, if you're searching for a body, you don't need to go much more than 100 yards off the road. So what, you, what they should have done is covered her entire route, 100 yards off the road all the way around. If they'd have really done a good job of the search, they'd have found her. But they were so convinced that the husband had done it that they really didn't do a good enough search. But... Hindsight's always 2020 on the things that we miss. With no body and no leads, the case went cold until eight months later, when John Aykroyd walked into the Camp Sherman store and told the shopkeeper he'd found a body in the woods. Nobody had any suspicions particular to him until he walks in to the store and says, I've found Kay Turner. He went to the store and reported that he'd found bones in a pair of yellow jogging shorts. 
I interviewed him in the car, and his face was perspiring, his forehead was perspiring, and it wasn't overly hot. And the one thing Clayton always told me is that John, and when he talked to him, and told him about the god awful stench when he found the body. Well, all it was is weathered white bones. There wouldn't have been any odor involved on it. There would have been as the body would have been decomposing. I had a very high suspicion that John Ackroyd was, knew more than he was telling us. For anybody that spends any time in the woods, scrap clothing is not real concerning. It's not uncommon at all to find clothing in the woods. And uh, so that's kind of hard to uh, believe that he was sure that it was her. We went back the next day with the scout troop and searched the area. We found a watch, the lower jawbone. I found a, ha a hair made into a bird's nest. I mean, he's sitting down eating lunch and he looks up there it's, and he sees this bird's nest. And it's not like any bird's nest he's seen. It's made out of this long blonde hair wrapped up with the twigs and all. And it was right there where she had gone down. Bodies dumped in the woods are often scattered by animals and ravaged by the elements. The bits of bones Ackroyd found were not obviously human. An avid outdoorsman like Ackroyd would probably have overlooked the scraps of clothing as nothing more than debris, but Ackroyd immediately identified them as Kays. These peculiarities, combined with the fact that Ackroyd was one of the last people to see Kay alive, made him a prime suspect in her murder. We got a hold of John and asked him to take a polygraph. He agreed to take the polygraph. Well, he failed the polygraph. So Bob Cooley and I interviewed him in my office, and he denied everything except that he did see her jogging along the road. His polygraph asked him if he'd ever touched Kay Turner, and he said no. Well, he, he, said he did. Polygraph showed that he did. So we asked him about that touching her. He said, well, he did touch her in February, and she was laying on top of the snow. During an interrogation after failing the lie detector test, Ackroyd changed his story and made a startling disclosure. He said that he'd first found Kay's body two months after her disappearance. His description was detailed and disturbing, noting that her eyes were gone and that animals had obviously been chewing on her body. Her throat had been slashed, and there was a hole in her chest that looked like the exit wound from a bullet. Ackroyd claimed he didn't report the discovery out of fear he would be blamed for Kay's death. The interrogation ended when Ackroyd asked for a lawyer. Do you think he came back out here in February? He just checked on... Sure. Yeah. 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 I think he was curious uh, how it was going. I would think he described exactly what he saw. Despite being convinced of Ackroyd's involvement in Kay's murder after the changes to his story, 
investigators had no hard physical evidence. If they had found her right away, they would have had a lot of evidence. They would have had the bullet, and they would have had the tracks, and not only the forensic evidence, but they would have had good, fresh witness information. The sooner you can get there and the sooner you can find somebody, the more evidence you're going to have to put the whole thing together. The longer it goes, the harder it gets. We had no evidence to hold him, so we let him go. That was about the end of the case as far as we were concerned. We, we kept interviewing people that come of interest. It bothered me to know that, know that he did it. I think about it quite often. He made the statement, why did I have to find her? I, I was the last one to see her alive. He was no doubt in my mind that he was the last person to see her alive. The suspicion and circumstantial evidence implicating Aykroyd weren't enough for police to arrest him. The investigation stalled, and he continued to live and work at Santam Junction, roaming Highway 20, alone. For more than a decade, Kay's case remained cold. There have been times people take people out, kill them, and bury them. There's other times where they've taken them out and just throw them on the ground after they got through and just leave them. It didn't surface again until July 10th, 1990. I walk out of court and there's a note there that says, call Jason Carlisle, Linn County DA. I call up Jason and he says, hey Bill, have you ever heard of John Aykroyd? And I said, yeah, John Aykroyd killed Kay Turner. And he said, well, his stepdaughter disappeared yesterday and we've got an active investigation going on. We had had a two-car head-on fatal accident. The Honda car had hit a semi head-on, and it had a, a young woman that was killed in the Honda car. And the semi had blocked the road in such a way that the tow trucks couldn't get it out, and they needed a piece of highway equipment. So John showed up at the scene. I deliberately saw to it that none of the normal guys that helped me help me remove the woman's body from the car. I asked Aykroyd to help me remove her from the car. And I did that because I wanted to see what his response was to handling this woman's body. And I was not prepared for what happened because as we took her out of the car, he told me that he was surprised at how light she was and that she weighed the exact same amount is Rashonda, his stepdaughter that was missing. She went missing on uh, July 10th, 1990. Around 10 o'clock is when she was missing. And if I would have had someone take me home then, I might have came up on something. It makes me so angry because like, I, I feel like she could have been saved. So who's the most likely suspect? John Arthur Aykroyd. I don't think I know who killed my sister. John Aykroyd is the one who killed my sister. She's up on that mountain somewhere. She's got to be. I know this road at the back of my head. Same with the stations, only up and back. Farms and truck stops, fireworks stands. I know this road like the back of my hand. By 1990, the case of Kay Turner's murder had long been cold. Police strongly suspected that state highway mechanic John Aykroyd had killed her, but lacked evidence to charge him. In the decade plus that had passed, some of the original investigators had retired, witnesses had moved away, and the Turner case had faded into the background as an unsolved murder. But soon, 
Another disappearance would reignite those lingering suspicions and draw a new generation of investigators into Ackroyd's orbit. In July of 1990, Rachanda Pickle was 13 years old. She loved animals, helping her mother with chores, and bossing around her 14-year-old brother, Byron. She lived with her family at Santiam Junction, a state highway maintenance yard at the junction of Highway 20 and Highway 22, about 26 miles west of Sisters. Just a typical 13-year-old, very much into the latest fashion of the time. Uh, very into the most top 40 music. She was wonderful. Couldn't ask for any, anything sweeter. She was funny and she was tiny. Rachanda was silly and goofy. We used to call her Punky Brewster because she looked exactly like Punky Brewster. With mom having to be the sole provider of the family, she had boyfriends and husbands, but they were always very short lived. Me and my sister had to rely on each other. Santiam Junction is a small and remote compound made up of the workers who live there and their families. The nearest towns are Sisters to the east and Sweet Home, where Byron and Richanda attended school to the west. It's an isolated spot, but after struggling for years to make ends meet as a single mom and enduring a string of bad relationships, Linda was willing to accept that isolation in exchange for the stability and security living with Ackroyd seemed to provide. We grew up very poor. From the outside looking in, it looked like John had a lot of money. He's able to go out and go have pizza, which was stuff we weren't really, you know, when you're poor, you can't really do a lot of that and stuff. So yeah, I'd, I remember meeting John. Because all I had in my life was men cheating on me, stealing from me, and I didn't have anything to steal. And John wasn't that type. And I thought I would be more safe and secure it seemed like that he was very stable. I mean, he had a job working for the state highway department. You know, he was a military guy and he was very good at making relationships very quick. 85 is when me and John got married. And I felt good that I could dress my kids not in rags. And I wanted my kids to graduate, you know, where I could be have, have things, more things than what I did when I was young. And it just backfired, you know? While living with John might have provided stability for Linda, it was a nightmare for her kids. Ackroyd was often described by those who knew him as unflappable and calm. But behind closed doors, he was violent and volatile. She used to have her bangs a certain way, same way, all the time. She didn't come in with her hair done one morning, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> what's wrong with you, you know? Why didn't you do your hair? And he had ripped a patch of her hair out. She showed up one day to school, she had a black eye. And she had a really big black eye and it had a little cut underneath it right here. I asked her, I'm like, Rochanda, what happened? And she said, my stepdad did this. Byron always had black eyes or fat lips. But they were very visibly, obviously abused children. So what was his relationship like with your kids? Very good, I mean, he, uh, um, we went fishing. Have you ever spanked her? Yes. Okay, we're fine. Uh, I made a paddle. And uh, at Linda's request, I started disciplining the kids. She got, she had to get on to me a couple times, but, you know, about her always having to discipline the kids and me not. Mm -hmm. So she said, you spank harder. Okay. 
I mean, I remember him uh, spanking her over one of those old school wind up alarm clocks and it got broke. That beating she got was over, over the top. It was scary. My mom was yelling at John to, to stop. There would be times way, and this was way before she came up missing, there would be times that his eyes would change color and he says, I want to kill someone. And I would holler at him and say, John, you're scaring me. It was a very fearful environment. And when John snapped, it was, it was scary. Are you a person that loses your temper at home? No. Okay. So you're pretty calm and cool most of the time? I'd say 98% of the time. She never wanted school to end. She'd always say, oh man, there's only two more hours of school. Oh man, there's only an hour left of school. It wasn't a healthy environment. We definitely knew at that age that not every child went through what we did. Our plan was, I mean, from a very young age, uh, our goal was just to get to 18 or to old enough just to get out. In her mind, she was gonna get away from him one day. And she would have. By the end of the school year in 1990, Richanda and Byron had convinced Linda to let them spend part of the summer with their biological father. The kids traveled to Medford to meet up with Stephen Pickle, a man they barely knew. I think it's part of every child, no matter how good or bad your parents are, that you want to know where you come from. You want to know what type of person they are. And we wanted to have the chance to get to know who our dad was and form our own opinion. It didn't take long after their arrival for things to get tense. Stephen Pickle confronted the kids about family rumors that Richanda had been sexually abused by both an extended family member and a man who Linda had been with before Ackroyd. My dad had us both sit down on the couch. I remember sitting there, me and her looking at each other, and it was just like, oh my gosh, we're going to have this conversation. And my dad was livid. Um, he was going to talk about getting an attorney and stuff and getting us both yanked from my mom. I mean, it was underneath her watch, and she didn't do anything about it. Later. Stephen Pickle reacted badly to Richanda and Byron's attempt to join a game of hide-and-seek with neighborhood kids, convinced it was an excuse for the young boys and girls to have sex. Devastated, Richanda demanded to go home to her mother. My uncle and my aunt were getting ready to come towards Sweet Home for a Family Reunion, so we went up to my Uncle Bob's place, dropped my sister off, and I knew I'd see her within a couple weeks. And I mean, it's still ingrained in my head, I've seen her in the back of my uncle's uh, Chevy Blazer. Richanda's ride dropped her off in Sweet Home. She immediately began looking for a way that she wouldn't have to return to Santiam Junction alone. She came to me and asked me if I would go to the junction with her and spend the night. And I said, I can't. Richanda was adamant about not going up, up there by herself, and I asked her why. She wouldn't tell me, because I don't. Will you just please go with me? And I said, I can't. I would, I would love to, but I can't. When them girls run away from family, sometimes there's reason for this, and I ask you if you sexually, ever sexually abused your daughter, right? and your answer was no. No. And I'm not accusing you of sexually abusing, I'm just... We're just uh, conducting an investigation. We want to make sure that every angle is covered. My, I've seen part of the acts in my sexual activity. Like if I'm high on sex, you know, and maybe not getting enough to remember, and trying to get the you know, maybe, oh, I've got a little bit of fresh stuff here, you know. That's sick. You know? But I know there's people out there who do that all the time. And I know some of them. Richanda's classmates, Mandy and Michelle, had been molested in their own home for years. Well before that summer, the sisters had begun to notice familiar signs in Richanda in addition to her symptoms of physical abuse. She had become depressed, was tired all the time, and had stopped caring as much about her appearance. Their suspicions seemed confirmed when Richanda told Michelle she'd sought help from their school's counselor. We were in the library, it was a book fair. I just look up and she was just, she was crying. And she said, I'll be, I'll be back. 
and she got up and left, came back to the library, I don't know, about 20 minutes later, and she said, you know what you told me that happened to you? And I'm like, yeah, that's happened to me too. During that time, you know, she got really depressed. She didn't want to go home. She kept asking, can I spend the night? Can I spend the night? Can I spend the night? And back then, my parents, we didn't, we weren't allowed to hardly spend a night with anybody. We pretty much had to beg. So they let her spend the night. That was a Friday night. A Saturday she stayed, and then that Sunday, her mom comes to get her, and Rochanda hid in my closet. Screaming and throwing fits, didn't want to leave. Throwing clothes over her, putting shoes, throwing shoes, throwing stuff at her mom. You don't act like that if you just, you know, going to be sent to your room. You know, you don't, you do not act like that. And she, she was literally terrified. Don't make me go. I don't want to go. Please don't make me go. And I think her mom's like, okay, okay, you can stay with Jennifer, but I don't think she got to. A couple weeks after that, that's when we snuck her. We had our older friends write a note. And forged my mom's name. We took that note, took it to the school, where Chanda walked home with us. We told her we were, we'd hide her for as long as we could. So we snuck her through our window, and she stayed the night with us. What can we do? We were, you know, we were little kids too. We tried. It's pretty bad when kids have to go that to that level to do that. I've never felt like anybody, any adult, who was put into the place of authority to help her ever helped her. I think that um, she did try to protect herself and nobody listened. Richanda continued trying to spend nights away from home whenever possible with any friends or relatives who could take her in. While she mostly kept the details of what she was going through to herself, it was clear that it was getting worse. She started cutting herself. Even in class, she would just take a tack and just cut herself. And I'd ask her, you know, is she all right? And she's just like, I don't want to be home. What's going on? And she, she wouldn't, you know, say what it, the exact reason was. Now getting older, I have my suspicions what those reasons were. When you're constantly in a state of fear all the time, actually analyzing what's going on is you can't. Because so you're just in a state of fear, you're on eggshells. You know, you just want to have a normal day. Just a normal day That's all you want. I remember her telling me and Mandy a couple things. One time I was doing dishes and he called me over on the couch and just started ch tickling me. And it got more aggressive to where he was trying to put his body on top of her. And Richanda had kicked enough somehow and got away. After that incident is when the other stuff started happening when he was coming into her room. She never said if anything had happened, but I'm pretty sure it did. We never felt like she had to because we were kind of going through the same thing at home. But it's not okay for him to go into her room at night. It was never okay. And I always felt like he was raping her. Had she been abused by, by anyone, by any of the men in her life that you know of? Not if I'm aware of. I don't ever recall her she being invited. Any no. concerns about that? No. My read of it now is that there was something going on at home with between John and Richanda because when Richanda did confide to mom what dad said, you know, how he was going to get charges filed and stuff. I know my mom told John, and it was the very next day that she was gone. When Richanda arrived back at Santiam Junction, it hadn't been long since she had confirmed to her biological father that she'd been sexually abused. After that conversation, her father had called Linda with threats to involve the authorities, and Linda had told John, Richanda tried and failed to ensure that she wouldn't be home alone without Byron. Then, Richanda disappeared. You know, she was home uh, when mom and dad left on the tent. She held back because she, 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 always, she asked me, mom, do you have to go to work? So there was something going on, but I just didn't see it then. John did not uh, work all day. He ended up coming home early. According to him, he asked her if she wanted to go w for a ride with him. She said no. Bertina did everything she could to get away from this man. She was not going to go and spend 
any alone time with him. There was just no way. His story was that he just went out to, to, on a drive to take pictures of deer. He never took pictures of deer. That was so far-fetched. He had driven all the way around there, and he has his camera with him, and he comes out on the road and makes sure that the other highway department workers see him, see he has a camera, and he makes a point, a point of, I'm going to establish myself an alibi. I was here at this particular time. According to him, when he returned, she wasn't home, and that was about noon or one-ish in the afternoon. And when he picked me up, he was talking about Rachanda wasn't there. After we got home, got dinner and all this stuff, I think it was around 10 to 5. I said, something's not right, John. I said, she should have been home. Where is she? You... And then he'd come back and tell me, well, I don't know. I said, well, obviously you should know you were here with her. I mean, there for the longest time when it was freshly, I just said, why didn't, I just go, oh, why didn't you go home? Why didn't you go home? You could have, you could have probably walked in. He wouldn't expect you there or whoever it may be. And then I've always said, well, if I would have been there, it would have happened on a different day. I remember that day. I remember mom calling saying, have I heard from her chanda? I'm like, no, why? Well, she's not home. And then, you know, automatically, well, you need to go down check with, you know, the Briggs boys and stuff, see if she's down there. We already did that. We already did that. I'm like, you guys need to call the cops. Well, John says that we can't call the cops until she's gone for 24 hours and stuff. I'm like, I don't know what to tell you then. I, she's up there. She's up there. How old is she? Uh, 13. When was the last time you saw her? It was 8.30 yesterday morning. And... You're just now calling in? Yeah. Did you think that, where did you think she was at? Well, I figured she was over to the next door neighbor. Did you check last night? Yeah. Okay, but you weren't concerned then to, see, I'm trying to find out why the delay of calling in. Well, I understand that when a child's missing, you've got to wait 24 hours before the case will even Oh, no, that's not true, not with children. Children are not, not at all with children. Oh, okay. There's no time limit on uh, a child. Oh, okay. I thought maybe there was. No, no, no. And then when mom called the next day saying Richanda hadn't made it home and told my dad, we, we need to go up there. He's like, no, we're going to play it out. I told him, I'm like, you either taking me home and stuff or I'm going to the truck stop and I'm going to find a trucker and I'm going to hitch a ride back home. And of course, that upset my dad. He started yelling at me and that's when I broke down crying. I told him. Something's wrong. Something's not right. And uh, the next day we loaded up into this vehicle and we drove up there. 100 searchers from six different county law enforcement agencies, including Lane County, spent their day poking through the wilderness near the Hoodoo Ski Area in search of 13-year-old Rashonda Leah Pickle. In the initial days, air searches of the mostly barren lava lands resulted in nothing. Now, ground crews are concentrating on the heavy underbrush that lines the roadways. Well, we had all the workers go out and look. I'm telling John, well, you should, you know this area, so tell them, you know. Did John seem worried about Richanda? 